It's not very often that Ainz makes a masterful play such as this, but it's when he does that it's always impressive beyond belief. Even if it was completely unintentional, the impression it left on Jerkniv had made him more terrified than he was before. It had left Ainz looking like this strategist of unfathomable intellect. But before we get to that, there's quite a bit to be said about the Slain Theocracy's meeting as well as Jerkniv's futile attempts to counter Ainz both of which help to establish a lot more about how the Empire and Theocracy operate. So, just like we did last time, let's take a look at everything the anime missed from the novels. Let's get started. Episode 42, Baharuth Empire, covering Chapter 3 from Volume 10 of the Light Novel. Going back to before Albedo had left for the capital, and that's when we finally learn about Ganungagap, the world item she's been carrying ever since she left. Apart from making her immune to the effects of other world items, this wand that shares the name with the Primordial Void is well known in Yggdrasil as the strongest anti-material weapon out there. It's an unbreakable item that can destroy physical objects en masse without any trouble whatsoever. Where the item starts to become a little less useful though is in situations against smaller single targets. It's not something you'd typically bring to a 1v1. Now, with this being the first time Albedo was sent outside solo, Ainz wasn't about to make the same mistake he had made with Shaltir. He had gone to make sure she was well prepared for pretty much everything. So, what this lecture entailed was a detailed breakdown of how he would fight her if he was the opponent. He was listing everything he'd do if the two were to do a PvP battle, giving a perspective of a skilled PKer he was sure she'd already made countermeasures for. But even so, Ainz knew he couldn't be too cautious about it. I mean, she was, after all, one of the creations of his precious guildmates. Switching over to the Slain Theocracy now, we're first introduced to the high priests who represent the six religious sects the country revolves around. With each representing one of the six great gods from 600 years ago, it was these high priests who made up the Theocracy's supreme executive agency, the authority of which was only second to the high priest's superior, and that was a position in which one of them would eventually succeed into anyway. So, out of all the elite to be gathered at this meeting, there were a few who you might be interested in. Like, Raymond, although the youngest, was actually a former member of the Black Scripture unit, making him a hero who'd been fighting to protect his country for 15 years now. Zinedine was one of the oldest, but that just made him unmatched when it came to knowledge and wisdom. Dominic was a ruthless member from the Sunlight Scripture, then Yvonne ranked at the top of all of them as the number one faithcaster. So, when you combine all this talent together in a single room, the resulting group is one that leads the Theocracy's population of 15 million, a highly disciplined rank of leaders in which all were equal. No person saw themselves as superior, but instead treated each other as friends all for the sake of humanity. That was the ultimate goal in which they strived to accomplish. Now, their discussion of the Sorcerer Kingdom was rather similar to the novels, but there was a slight translation issue when they were talking about the Empire. It wasn't a paladin that made manipulation unlikely, but instead the wizard Fluter Paradine. His rank as the Empire's strongest sorcerer made the prospect of magical manipulation seem impossible. What seemed just as unlikely as well though was the report given to them by their Thousand Leagues Astrologer, the seventh seat of the Black Scripture responsible for providing intelligence. You see, the army she described was practically unfathomable. With 200 Death Knights and 300 Soul Eaters, the destructive potential they possessed was enough to destroy both kingdoms, the Empire, and the City-State Alliance. It was an army of undead that even the Theocracy knew they couldn't defend against. I mean, if they're aware enough to refer to it as unfairly overpowered, then I think they know as well as we do just how outmatched they are. What really went to hammer home that fact, though, was the rest of the report regarding the outcome of the war. You see, the implementation of what could only be Tier 11 super magic was enough to indicate the advent of a god or perhaps the second coming of Lord Solshana. The latter was rather unlikely, but it is worth knowing that this Lord Solshana was the god of death from 600 years ago, a powerful entity defeated only by the eight kings of Avarice. Not much else was said about who he was, but apparently he does have a devout follower who can predict his resurrection. Now, when the priests went on to discuss their plan for the kingdom next, the reason they didn't just take it over themselves was because the council state next to them would likely find it threatening. If they suddenly became neighbors with the exact people their doctrine led them to hate, then it's very likely their own people would try to call for war against them. And that was a prospect that they needed to minimize the chances of since the council state was home to the Platinum Dragonlord. As the child of the famous Dragon Emperor, a fight against him would only result in their country being decimated so it really wasn't best for their own nation to become neighbors with those it felt should be destroyed. 
especially when they didn't have the power to enforce it. Getting back to the issue at hand, there was quite a lot to consider when discussing what to do next about the Sorcerer Kingdom. I mean, with so many losses recently plaguing its ranks, as well as the current war the Theocracy was having with the Elves, there wasn't much that they could really do right now. If you're wondering what this war is with the Elves though, well, that's something that's been going on for quite a few years now. You see, while initially the two did have a peaceful relationship, something had happened which made them hate each other. The priests weren't very specific when they were talking about it, but they did mention something about the war being used to avenge some girl's mother. Apparently this girl was taken away from her mother, then raised in the theocracy in a way that many of the current priests weren't very fond of. It's not like they disliked the power that she brought to the nation, but the personality the previous priests left with her wasn't very favorable. Regardless, the purpose of this war was to get revenge for her. Of course, the Theocracy could have just sent her out to finish it herself, but an action like that would potentially awaken the Dragon Lord, a possibility that led them to bring up the idea of using their world item on him. Since their choices were either Ainz or the Catastrophe Dragon Lord, the High Priests decided it was safest to use it against the latter. At least they knew for sure its effects would work on him. When it came to Ainz though, the priests weren't quite certain its powers would work on someone who was capable of wild magic, so it definitely wasn't a good idea to test on him. Now, there was a bit more to be said about the Dragon Kingdom and this ongoing elf war, but I think that's all just set up for a future arc. The most you need to know right now is what the Theocracy is planning to do about it. That and their seemingly dedicated attitude towards this girl. If we switch over to the Empire now, there was a little bit more to Jerkniv's worries than just 4,000 of his knights wanting to retire. I mean, sure, 6% of his 60,000 was a massive loss, but the real loss came with the expenses required to fill that gap. Finding the funds and time needed to cultivate these professional warriors certainly wasn't something that Jerkniv had right now. Then, to make matters worse, whatever knights there were that did remain, most were signing a petition that requested Jerkniv not to go to war right now. Of course, a petition like that wasn't even necessary, but the fact that it still came to his desk was a clear sign that his knights had lost their confidence in him. You see, because Jerkniv was the one who requested Ainz to use his strongest spell, it was only natural the knights blame him for the hellscape Ainz had created that day. They couldn't help but see Jerkniv as the perpetrator of it all. There was certainly no way for Jerkniv to know that this would be the outcome, but the reputation he'd built for himself had made the knights think that he did. His notoriety as such an outstanding emperor left the knights suspecting that he had personally requested this spell. So, as all of them were starting to turn against him, Jerkniv's only hope was to ally with the Theocracy. Their history as a nation older than the Empire's, combined with their specialization in the practice of faith magic, made them the perfect allies to team up with. Now, a scene that the anime didn't include after this was a particular conversation with the secretary about the Empire's shrines. It was another discussion carried out in code just in case Ainz was listening. It's not like Jerkniv's palace wasn't protected against espionage, but considering the sorcerer that he was hiding from, it was likely best to assume that he could easily infiltrate it. Not to mention that he actually felt like he was being watched sometimes. So, as Jerkniv secretly discussed the matter of the shrines, he had come to find out that his priests were becoming increasingly impatient with him. His lack of visits after befriending an undead was certainly cause for concern with those who opposed the undead. But despite the shrine's numerous requests for him to visit, Jerkniv had refrained from seeing them out of the fear that Ainz might perceive it as hostile. He was too scared to make an enemy out of Ainz, and informing the priests about him would only increase the chances of that. Of course, not telling them anything either would also eventually just lead to their rebellion. So extreme caution needed to be taken when planning a visit with them. One thing to note about Jerkniv's current condition here is that, despite drinking multiple potions to relieve the pain, there was a soreness in his stomach that just wouldn't go away. No amount of healing or medicine could subside the stress Ainz's visage was causing in him. Thinking there was hope did sometimes make him feel a bit better, but whenever he'd go back to realizing that there wasn't, that's when the pain would be at its strongest. Fast forward to two weeks later, and that's when we get to the day of the meeting. An eventful affair preceded by this discussion in the carriage first. Jerkniv would have preferred to have all four of his strong knights with him, but the woman Heavy Bomber wasn't someone that he could trust anymore. You see, not only had she expressed an interest in the Sorcerer Kingdom, but she had also once said how she would turn her sword on the Emperor. Something about how if the curse plaguing her was broken, then she would gladly turn against him to do so. This wasn't something that Jerkniv could really blame her for, but he also couldn't just let her do whatever she wanted either. Like, if she was to run away and do her own thing, 
Jerknev knew he would have no choice but to hunt her down because of all the state secrets she possessed. Considering how she was one of the strongest in the Empire, though, the very task of doing so would require Lightning or Stormwind. Perhaps even the assassin in Janya. So, when contemplating just how much work it would be to manage heavy bomber's defection, the best option was to simply not let her go near any intelligence at all. That way, if she did one day flee to the Sorcerer Kingdom, there wouldn't be any intel that she could take with her in the first place. Now, that's not to say that Heavy Bomber was even considering this, but the risk she carried was simply too high to ignore. Even if she did promise to remain loyal until her debt was repaid, Jerknev couldn't dismiss the threat that she posed to the Empire. She could very well just be biding her time until she could sell herself as more than just a powerful fighter. Now, once Jerknev got to the arena, the adventurers he met were explained with a little more detail. The thief was a fixer which is more assassin than rogue, while Fan Long Gu was a monkey-type beastlord possessing the power of an ape. So, as a warrior harboring the spirit of a forest animal, that made him stronger than Basswood, the strongest knight Jerknev currently had with him. Then, the healer was a worshipper of Buddhism, then Poapan was a mysterious totem shaman. Those were the people responsible for protecting the emperor here. A quick little thing to note about Buddhism was that this was a minor deity said to be a subordinate to the Four Great Gods, a religious faith completely separated from any politics. The fact they did boast the ability to combat the undead though, did make Jerknev think that he should go see them more. He felt it was time to pressure the shrines and see if they could actually be helpful or not. Moving on, the first thing the bard did to assist with Jerknev's protection was sing a song to make his and everyone else's movements a whole lot sneakier. Normally an instrument would have been required to cast the spell, but Freywald's hair could do it just by singing. He could cast these intonations by simply making the sounds with his mouth. That being the case, Jerknev became curious as to how potent these bard skills could be. He wanted to know if perhaps they could be used to manipulate people, kind of like how Demiurge had done to them. So, of the ones Freywald's knew, the two he provided were Suggestion and Charm Person, two intonations that worked just like how the spell equivalent did. Whether a person or monster was capable of casting it though remained a mystery since not even Freywalds knew. Jerknev couldn't deduce whether this ability was something unique to frog monsters or not. There did exist toadmen who could cause confusion, but there wasn't much on frogmen who could activate intonations instantly, making them a topic Jerknev was very eager to learn more about. Setting aside this paranoia of Demiurge though, his next concerns quickly shifted to the room he was in. No amount of caution was too great when facing off against Ainz. Of course, the adventurers didn't know that that's what they were up against, but it was likely that they were somewhat aware of his power already. You see, despite there being restrictions on anything related to Ainz, Jerknev knew it was impossible to keep all his soldiers quiet. So, even with many details being kept under lock, if anyone was to know about Ainz's power, it would definitely be these high-ranking adventurers. That said, it was the very uncertainty behind Ainz's total potential that fueled Jerknev's paranoia to the level it was right now. Since he wasn't sure how strong him or his retainers actually were, every precaution possible was needed in order to counter their limitless potential for espionage. It was a tedious step that would remain necessary until more intel was found on them. Jerknev did have a plan to do exactly that, but that revolved around attempting to appeal to Mare. Perhaps by importing a lot of elves into the Empire, Jerknev could use them to get some information from him. They did also consider doing the same to Aura, but because they thought that she was still an aggressive child, they figured it was safest to stick with Mare, also because they assumed that he was an older woman. Now, a quick thing to note about these battles in the Coliseum is that the loser doesn't necessarily have to be killed. The old days did dictate that they had to be put to death, but that was changed when an entertaining loser was saved and then became champion. So, out of the prospect that there could be more just like him, the losers of the fights were no longer executed after their battles. Getting to the actual meeting now, the letter the Theocracy gave was just a basic inquiry, a simple query that can be summed up into two basic questions. The first was why Jerknev asked Ainz to use the spell he did, and the second was how much intelligence did he have. They were the standard questions anyone would ask considering the relationship they were trying to build. But, as we saw, Jerknev's ability to answer those questions was quickly hindered by the appearance of Ainz, a scene that did extremely well to highlight Jerknev's panic. Since Ainz's movements were supposed to be a top-level priority, the fact he'd still gotten into the country in secret went to shock him even more. Every countermeasure he'd so meticulously set in place was immediately made null by this entity of unmatched intellect. 
So, with no idea as to how far this plan of Ainz's could go, Jerknip was stuck in the most effective attack the Sorcerer Kingdom could have made. Not only did it pressure multiple nations while preventing their alliance, but it also exposed a massive leak and confirmed the Theocracy's suspicions. There was no more doubt that the Empire had sided with Ainz and betrayed humanity. Now, one of the core reasons why this was such an issue was because Jerknip had effectively made himself an enemy of the Shrines now. You see, because the High Priests of the Temples were there as well, they too could no longer trust that Jerknib was on the side of humanity. And since the Shrines were a useful asset to the people, he couldn't just purge them as enemies of the Empire. Not only that, but it was very possible that they would try to banish him as the Emperor as well, resulting in a new internal issue that Jerknib had to consider as well now. But yeah, that's pretty much it for Episode 3. Now, before I go, a huge thanks as always to everyone who donated through the comments. Your generosity really is very much appreciated. If you're looking to support the channel through another way though, you can always purchase the returning Succubay shirts. They're only going to be around for a limited time again, so be sure to try and get them before they're gone. But anyway, as always thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed this type of anime content then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!